Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're going to be diving into trading. Uh huh. Specifically for those of you who are, you know, brand new, brand new, right? Mm. Noobs, noobs to the world of trading. Noobs, yeah. So we're cracking open uh, high probability trading by Marcel Link. Oh yeah. And classic. Yeah, and let me tell you, this book was a real eye opener. I bet. Even for me, someone who, you know, I thought I knew a thing or two about the markets. Sure. I was like, oh wow, there's a lot more to this than I realized. Yeah, Marcel Link, he really hits on some uh, some key things. Yeah. And one of the things I really appreciate about him is his honesty. Right. Like, he doesn't sugarcoat uh, at the challenges of trading. No, not at all. But he also provides a very, you know, clear and actionable path to success. Yeah. You know, it's not like one of those get-rich-quick schemes. Yeah. Like, he emphasizes right off the bat yeah. the importance of treating those first few years oh, yeah. as a learning experience. Learning experience, exactly. He actually compares it to... Um, what do you say? Jumping into trading. Jumping into trading without proper preparation. Yeah. It's like trying to perform brain surgery at home. It's risky business. Oh, absolutely. You don't want to be poking around in there without knowing what you're doing. No, no, definitely not. And speaking of risky business... Oh, yeah. He talks about his own experience uh -huh. losing, get this, over $75,000 in his early years of trading Wow! before he became consistently profitable. That's a pretty sobering number. It is. But you know what? It really drives home the point yeah. that trading is a skill. Yeah. It takes time. Uh, Dedication to master. Right. You're not just going to become a millionaire overnight. No, you're not. You've got to put in the work. you got to put in the work. you got to learn the ropes. And you got to be prepared to make mistakes. Yeah. And learn from them. Learn from those mistakes, for sure. He even calls this initial capital learning capital. I love that term, learning capital. Because that's really what it is, right? It is. It's an investment in yeah. your trading education. Exactly. And he stresses that okay. the focus during those early years yeah, should yeah. be on preserving your capital. Preserving. Okay. Not necessarily it, on making huge profits. Right. Right. Remember the story he tells? Oh, which story? About the trader who wrote PTC? PPC. Oh, yeah. On his trading pads. I forgot about that one. Yeah. Remind me. Remind me. So PPC stands for? Oh, here we go. Preserve Precious Capital. Preserve Precious Capital. P P C and it's just a powerful reminder yeah. that your primary goal as a newbie as a beginner trader right is to protect your money not lose it all yeah exactly the winds will come later it's like it's like learning to walk before you run exactly right you wouldn't enter a marathon without training uh uh so trading is the same way okay so take it slow build up your skills yeah. Build your confidence gradually. So just take it one step at a time, basically. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One step at a time. Okay. I like that. He even compares it to tennis, okay. saying the focus should be yeah. on getting the ball over the net consistently. Okay. Letting your opponent make the mistakes. So it's not about trying to like- Hit a home run. Hit a home run every time. Yeah. Yeah. It's about playing the long game. Playing the long game. Hanging smart decisions. Yeah. Minimizing your losses. Exactly. Oh. Which brings us to another key point. That Link emphasizes uh, setting realistic goals. Ooh, setting realistic goals. Okay. Because a lot of new traders come in. Oh, I bet. With these wild expectations. That's in it. I've seen it. You know, they think they're going to... Turn a few thousand dollars. Turn a few thousand dollars. Into a fortune. Into a fortune overnight. Yeah, I've seen those ads. Oh, those ads. It's like make a million dollars in a month. Right. I'm like, okay, if it were that easy, everyone would be doing it. Exactly. And Link... He's very realistic. Yeah. He points out that so, trading yeah. is a challenging endeavor. It is. And the odds of achieving mm -hmm. those kinds of returns are yeah. slim to none. So you got to be realistic, right? You got to be realistic. Don't expect to. Don't expect to get rich quick. Get rich quick, no. He even has a section in the book called... Oh, what is it? I just want to make 10,000%. That's not unreasonable, is it? 10,000%. Yeah. I mean, it sounds pretty unreasonable to me, but... Spoiler alert. It is. It is. It is incredibly unreasonable. Yeah, you're not going to... Yeah, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Not overnight, anyway. No. Okay, so... And what's a more realistic goal, then? Yeah, what is a realistic goal for a beginner trader? Well, Link, he stresses the importance of... Okay. ...understanding market ranges. Market ranges, okay. And using tools like... Like what? The average true range. Average true range. Or ATR. APR. Okay. Yeah, oh, potential price movements. Potential price Wrong movements, yeah. Hold on, hold on. Let's break that down a bit. For okay. those of us who are like, 
average true range. What is that? All right. So imagine you're watching a stock. Okay. That typically moves about a dollar a day. Okay. A dollar a day. Got it. The ATR helps you quantify that range. Okay. Let's say the ATR for that stock is one dollar. Right. That means that on average, okay, the stock moves within a one dollar range each day. Each day. Okay, so it could go up a dollar. It could go up a dollar. It could go down a dollar. Go down a dollar. It could stay the same. Exactly. Right. So setting a goal to make, you know, five dollars on that stock in a single day. In a single day. That would be unrealistic. Would be unrealistic. Okay, so the ATR helps you set. Helps you set realistic profit targets. Realistic profit targets. Yep. Based on the stocks. Historical volatility. Oh, historical volatility. Okay, got it. So you're looking at yeah. how much it's moved in the past oh, well. to get an idea of how much it's likely to move in the future. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. So instead of aiming for the moon. Right, aiming for those like... Yeah, those crazy... 10,000% returns. 10,000% returns, yeah. Focus on making consistent, achievable gains. Consistent, achievable gains. Yeah. Okay. One step at a time. One step at a time. I like it. Don't get caught up in the hype. Uh -huh. Don't try to make a quick buck. No, be patient. Right. Be patient, be consistent. Okay. And the profits will come. All right. I'm feeling good about this already. I think we're off to a good start. Yeah. yeah. Link also talks about how individual traders uh -huh. often feel like they're at a disadvantage. Oh, yeah. Compared to these professional traders, right? Absolutely. Like we're going into battle. With a slingshot. With a slingshot. And they've got tanks and missiles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He uses the analogy of Napoleon. It's Napoleon. Thinking he would win any war mm -hmm. just because he had the biggest cannons. He had all the firepower. He had all the firepower. Yeah. And in trading, those cannons are the tools and information uh. available to institutions. So they've got all the like the fancy algorithms and stuff. Yeah, they've got the algorithms. They've yeah. got the high frequency trading systems. They've right. got access to all this data that we don't have. Yeah, it can feel a little overwhelming. It can. It can. But he also points out, though, that with the Internet. Yes. And these online trading platforms. Yeah. That gap has narrowed considerably. It has. It really has. Like we have access to a lot of the same resources now that we didn't have before. Yeah. So we've got real time quotes, uh -huh. charts, charts, yeah. News feeds. News feeds. That were once exclusive to the big players. So it's a more level playing field? It's a more level playing field. And it used to be. Absolutely. Okay. That's good news. That's good news for us. Good news for the little guy. Yeah. Now there's another um yeah. kind of surprising tool that he advocates for that i found really interesting what's that paper charts paper charts paper charts i love paper charts in today's digital world yeah why would anyone bother with paper charts <laughs> well you know I, I think link believes yeah that physically drawing out the charts mm. connecting those highs and lows yeah with your own hand with your own hand yeah creates a deeper more intuitive understanding of market movement right. it's not just about looking at a screen right it's about actually feeling it feeling it yeah you know getting your hands dirty i never thought about it that way yeah i think there's something to be said for that tactile experience yeah you know it's like the difference between reading a recipe okay and actually cooking the dish cooking the dish yeah y you know you get a different level of understanding when you're actually doing it when you're actually doing it yeah okay so it's about engaging with the market yeah. on a more visceral level. On a more visceral level, absolutely. Okay, I'm starting to see his point. I'm glad. Now let's talk about news. Okay, news. I think a lot of new traders mm -hmm. assume that if they can just jump in. On a hot news item. On a hot news item. Yeah. Fast enough, mm -hmm. they can make a quick profit. Yeah, that's a common misconception. It is. And Link has a fascinating perspective on this. Okay, wait on me. He argues that yeah. more often than not, mm -hmm. the market has already priced in the news okay. by the time it hits the headlines. Wait, what? So the market is basically predicting the future? In a way, yes. Okay. Think of it like this. Yeah. The market is made up of... Millions of participants. Millions of participants. Right. All constantly processing information mm -hmm. and trying to anticipate what's going to happen next. Yeah. So by the time a news story breaks... Yeah. The collective wisdom of the market right. has often already factored that information into the price. So the news itself might not be the trigger for a price move, right? but rather the market's reaction to the news. The market's reaction, yeah. Okay, how it confirms. Or contradicts, or contradicts yes. expectations. Expectations, exactly. Okay, okay. 
So it's not about reacting to the headlines. It's well, about understanding yeah. the underlying dynamics mm -hmm. that are driving the market. Okay. So give me an example. Like, how would this play out? Okay. So Link gives the example of a stock called Rambus. Rambus. Okay. That actually tanked before. The official yeah. news of a legal setback was released. So the market had already... The market had already sensed trouble. Sensed trouble. Okay. Yeah. And reacted accordingly. So even though the news hadn't come out yet, mm -hmm. the price was already dropping. The price was already dropping. Because people were anticipating. Anticipating bad news. Bad news. Okay. So if bad news comes out mm -hmm. and the stock doesn't drop... Doesn't drop. Okay. Or even goes up... Goes up. Okay. It could be a signal that the market was expecting. The market was expecting... Even worse news. Even worse news. Okay, yeah. and maybe even overreacted initially. Okay, so it's like a... a it's a counterintuitive... Counterintuitive, yeah. ...way of thinking about news. Yeah, it's not about... It's not about... Just reacting to the headline. Yeah. It's about trying to understand... Understand. ...what the market's already... We're thinking, noted. yeah, what the market's already anticipating. Okay, so the market is always... The market is always looking ahead. Looking ahead, yeah. Trying to anticipate... What's next? Trying to anticipate what's next. Okay. And that brings us to... Here we go. Another key concept that Link emphasizes. Okay. The power of multiple time frames. Multiple time frames. All right. Break it down for me. Okay. So imagine you're looking at a map. Okay. A map. Got it. You can zoom in. To see the details of a particular street. To see the details of a particular street. Yeah. Okay. But you also need to zoom out mm. to see the bigger picture. The bigger picture. Yeah. The surrounding neighborhoods. The highway. Right. The context. The context. Exactly. Okay. So in trading, yeah. you might look at a daily chart. Okay. A daily chart. To see the overall trend. The overall trend. Okay. But then you zoom in. To an hourly chart. To an hourly. Or a five minute chart. Or even a five minute chart. Yeah. To fine tune your entry and exit points. To fine tune your entry and exit points. Exactly. Okay. So you're getting both the zoomed in view yeah. and the big picture. The zoomed in view and the big picture. Yeah. Right. Okay. I like You're it. combining those macro and micro perspectives right. to get a more complete picture. Of what's happening in the market. Of what's happening in the Rehangling. market. Yeah. This is making a lot more sense now. Good. I'm glad. It's about seeing the forest and the trees. Seeing the forest and the trees. Exactly. You got to have both. You got to have both, yeah. Okay. And Link is a big proponent of using this... Multi-time frame analysis. Multi-time frame analysis, okay. To identify trends. Identify trends, okay. And ride the waves of those trends. Ride the waves. All right. What do they mean by ride the waves? So he's referring to the fact okay. that markets move in waves. Okay. Even within a strong trend. You're yep. not going to see a str no. straight line up or down. Okay. There will be... Pullbacks. Pullbacks and bounce bounces. Bounces. Okay. Say. Along the way. So even in a strong uptrend, yep. there will be periods where the price dips down. Exactly. And those dips are actually buying opportunities. Those dips are buying opportunities. Okay. And conversely, yeah. in a downtrend, mm -hmm. those bounces up okay. can be opportunities to sell. Sell over. Or short the stock. Short the stock. All right. So it's about being patient. Patient, okay. Waiting for those pullbacks or bounces, uh -huh. and then entering the trade. At a more favorable price. At a more favorable price, okay. with less risk. Okay, so don't chase the market. You don't chase the market. Wait for it to come to you. Wait for it to come to you, yeah. Be patient. Be patient, be disciplined. Discipline, okay. And wait for those high probability setups. High probability setups, I like it. Yeah, I think we've covered a lot of ground already. We have, this is great stuff. Just in this first part of our deep dive. I know, I'm, I'm really starting to wrap my head around this. I'm glad to hear it. This is really good, really good. Good, I think we're off to a good start then. Yeah, I think so too. We've got a lot more to cover. I know, I'm excited for the next part. But we'll save that for next time. Okay, sounds good to me. All right. All right, so until then. Until then. Happy trading, everybody. Happy trading. Welcome back to the deep dive. I'm ready to get back into Marcel Link's high probability trading and see what other gems we can unearth. Me too. There's so much good stuff in here. Last time we were talking about those, you know, crucial first few years. The learning years. Yeah, the learning years of trading and how important it is to set realistic goals. Right. Not expect to get rich quick. Exactly. And we talked about news. Yeah. How the market actually reacts to it. Yeah. And how it's not always what you think. The market's always trying to anticipate what's next. Like it has a mind of its own. In a way, it does. 
We also talked about multiple time frames. Multiple time frames. Right, getting that zoomed in view. Yeah. And the big picture. Seeing the forest and the trees. Exactly. But we didn't really get into the nuts and bolts of how to actually identify those high probability trades. Yes, the nitty gritty, the actual strategies. Right, the tools and techniques that Link uses. I'm eager to hear more about that. Okay, well, one of his favorite tools okay. is something called stochastics. Stochastics, okay. Now, I know that sounds kind of intimidating. Yeah, a little bit. But it's actually a pretty straightforward concept. <laughs> okay, I'm all ears. So imagine you're at a carnival. Okay, I love carnivals. And there's a strength testing game. Oh, yeah, you swing the hammer. You swing the hammer. Try to ring the bell. Try to ring the bell. See how strong you are. Exactly. I've never been able to ring that bell. Well, stochastics is kind of like that. Okay. It measures where a stock's closing price falls uh -huh. within its recent price range. Okay. So if a stock closes near the high of its yeah. recent range, right. stochastics would be high. Okay. Suggesting strong upward momentum. Like a really powerful hammer swing. Exactly. Like you're really hitting that bell hard. Okay, I get it. And if it closes near the low of its range. And stochastics would be low. So stochastics would be low. Thank you. Indicating weaker momentum. Like a weak little tap. Yeah, you barely even graze the bell. Okay, so it's like a momentum indicator. It is a momentum indicator. But how do we actually use this to make trading decisions. So Link looks for what are called stochastic crossovers. Stochastic crossovers, okay. So stochastics is represented by two lines on a chart. Okay. A fast one called Priscane. Priscane. Priscane, got it. And a slower one called Persini. Persit. Okay. The faster Persine K line yeah. crosses above the slower Persine line line. Okay. It can be a buy signal. A buy signal. Like th those two lines are having a conversation, hmm. and when they cross, they're telling us something important. Oh, I like that. Like they're giving us a little signal. They're giving us a signal. All right, so we're watching for those crossovers. Watching for those crossovers. Now, are these signals stronger? Yes. In certain areas. So these signals are even stronger when they happen in extreme zones. Okay. So imagine the bell at our carnival game uh -huh. has markers for super strong at the top. Okay. Super strong at the top. And weakling at the bottom. Weakling at the bottom. I've been there many times. So if stochastics is up in that super strong zone. Above 80, right? Above 80, yeah. Okay. And the percent K line crosses below the percent D line. Okay. That's a pretty good indication that the upward momentum might be fading. It's time to sell. It might be time to consider selling. Okay. And the opposite is true as well. So if it's down in the weakling zone. Down in the weakling zone, below 20. Below 20. And the K crosses above the per C. That could be a buy signal. That could be a buying opportunity. Okay, so we're looking for those crossovers in those extreme zones. Exactly. All right, I'm starting to get the hang of this. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Now, I remember you mentioned another oscillator. Yes. That Link likes to use. The relative strength index. The relative strength index. Oh, yeah, RSI. RSI, that's right. Remind me how this one works. Okay, think of RSI as a thermometer for the market. A thermometer, okay. It measures the strength of recent price movements. Recent price movements, okay. Looking back over a certain number of days, usually 14. 14 days, got it. So if a stock has been on a tear. Big up days. Lots of big up days. Yeah. Its RSI would be high. Okay. Indicating a hot market. A hot market, okay. Like a thermometer showing a high temperature. Got it. A high RSI, typically above 70. Above 70, okay. Suggests the market might be getting overheated. Overheated, okay. And due for a cool down. A cool down or a pullback? Oh, or a pullback, exactly. So it's like a warning sign. It can be a warning sign, yeah. That things might be getting a little too hot. A little too frothy? Too frothy, yeah, I like that. And on the flip side. Okay. A low RSI below 30. Below 30, okay. Would indicate a cold market. A cold market, all right. Potentially signaling a buying opportunity. Like finding a bargain at a clearance sale. Exactly. Everything's on sale. Okay, I like it. So you've got stochastics mm -hmm. and RSI. Both helping us identify those potential turning points. Those turning points, yeah. What other tools does Link have in his arsenal? He's also a fan of the Mass D. The Mass D. What is that? The moving average convergence divergence. Oh my goodness, that sounds complicated. It sounds complicated. Break it down for me. But it's actually pretty simple. Okay, all right. Think of mass CD as a race between two moving averages. Okay, race, all right. A fast one and a slow one. Got it. Moving averages, those are those lines on the chart that smooth out the price fluctuations, right? Exactly, they smooth out the noise. So we can see the trend more clearly. See the trend more clearly, yeah. Okay, I'm with you. So the mass city tracks the relationship between these two moving averages, okay. showing us whether momentum is increasing or decreasing. So how does that translate into actual trading signals? 
when the fast moving average crosses above the slow one, okay, it generates a bullish signal. Bullish, so that means the price is likely to go up. Price is likely to go up, yeah. Okay. Like the fast runner is overtaking the slow runner. They're pulling ahead. They're pulling ahead. Got it. Indicating a shift in the balance of power. Okay, that's a good analogy. And when the fast moving average crosses below the slow one, okay. it's a bearish signal. Bearish, so the price is likely to go down. Price is likely to go down. Okay. So it's like the slow runner is now in the lead. The momentum is shifting. The momentum is shifting. Okay, so NCD is kind of like stochastics. It is. In that we're looking for those crossovers. Looking for crossovers. But instead of per K and per D line lines, yeah. we're looking at moving averages. Moving averages. Okay. Yeah. And like the other oscillators, mass CD can also be used to identify divergences. Divergences? Okay. Those instances where the price action and the indicator aren't telling the same story. Aren't telling the same story. Yeah. So give me an example of that. So if a stock is making higher highs. Okay. Higher highs. But the mass CD is making lower highs. Oh, that's a red flag. That could be a warning sign. If the upward trend is losing steam. Exactly. It's like the market is putting on a brave face, mm. but the underlying fundamentals are weakening. So the MAN CD is giving us a little heads up. It's giving us a heads up. That things might not be as rosy as they seem. Mm -hmm. Exactly. These oscillators are like secret weapons. They are powerful tools. They're helping us see things that we wouldn't normally see. They can help you see things in the market that yeah. you might not otherwise notice. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But Link also stresses the importance of... Okay. Not relying on any single indicator in isolation. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. Use multiple indicators to confirm your signals. Multiple indicators, multiple pieces of evidence. Okay, that makes sense. So you're building a strong case for the trade. I like that, building a case. Like a detective gathering clues. Okay, so we've got oscillators mm -hmm. helping us identify potential trade setups. Right. But trading isn't just about entries. No, it's also about knowing when to get out. When to get out, exactly. Whether it's a winner or a loser. You got to have an exit strategy. Absolutely. Exiting gracefully. That's what Link calls it. <laughs> gracefully. I like that. And that means having a plan for both taking profits okay. and cutting losses. So you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to hold them. And know when to fold them. And know when to fold them. And now, we've talked about stops before. We have. Those orders that automatically sell your position. If the price falls to a certain level. Right. They're like our safety net. They're your safety net. Protecting us from those big losses. Big losses, yeah. If a trade goes against us. Exactly. And Link discusses different types of stops. Okay. Including fixed stops. Fixed stops. Trailing stops. Trailing stops and volatility-based stops. Volatility-based stops. Okay, remind me how those work. Okay, so a fixed stop is simply placing a stop-loss order. Okay. At a specific price level. Okay. Regardless of what the market does. So you're just saying, if it hits this price, I'm out. I'm out no matter what. No matter what. Okay. A trailing stop is a bit more dynamic. Okay. It moves up as the price rises. Okay. Locking in profits. Okay. But it doesn't move down At if the night. price falls. So it's like a ratchet. It's like a ratchet, yeah. It only goes one way. It only goes one way. It locks in those profits. Locks in those profits, exactly. But it lets the trade run if it's going in your favor. Let's it run, yeah. Okay. And a volatility-based stop. Okay. Adjusts based on the market's volatility. Volatility, okay. So if the market is choppy and volatile, okay. your stop will be wider. Wider, okay. Giving the trade more room to breathe. So you're not getting stopped out. You're not getting whipsawed out. Whipsawed out, yeah. Just because of normal market fluctuations. Okay. If the market is calm. Then your stop will be tighter. Your stop will be tighter. Okay. So you're adapting your stops. Adapting, okay. To the market conditions. Okay, so you got to be flexible. Got to be flexible. You got to adjust to the market. Adjust to the market, yeah. Now, just as important as having a plan for cutting losses mm -hmm. is having a plan for taking profits right. Absolutely. You got to know when to walk away from the table. You got to know when to walk away. When you're ahead. When you're ahead, exactly. It's like so easy to get greedy it's... and let those profits slip away. It happens to the best of us. So what are some strategies for taking profits? Well, one approach is to set target prices. Target prices, okay. Based on your analysis of the chart mm. or the stock's historical volatility, Okay. you could also use trailing stops to lock in profits. As the stock rises? As the stock rises. Okay, that makes sense. Another strategy is to scale out of a position gradually. Scale out? What do you mean? So instead of selling your entire position at once, okay. you sell portions of it Okay. as the price hits your target levels. Okay, so like if you bought 100 shares, yeah. you might sell 
25 at your first target. 25 at the first target. Another 25 at your second target. Another 25 at the second target. And so on. And so on. So you're locking in some profits along the way. Locking in profits. But you're still letting the rest of the trade run. Letting the rest of the trade run, yeah. If it's going in your favor. If it's going in your favor. Exactly. That's, like, that's a way to manage your risk. Manage your risk. And maximize your potential reward. Maximize potential reward. It's about finding that sweet spot between greed and fear. Greed and fear. Two powerful emotions. Two very powerful emotions. Yeah, one thing that really resonated with me uh -huh. in Link's book yeah. is his emphasis on the psychological aspects of trading. Oh, absolutely. He even dedicates a whole chapter to it. He does. Called, um, what is it? The Inner Side of Trading, Keeping a Clear Mind. Keeping a clear mind, so important. It is because we all know yeah. how easy it is. To get caught up in the emotion. To get emotional, yeah, when you're trading. The excitement of a winning trade. Yeah, or the fear of a losing trade. The fear of a losing trade, exactly. And those emotions can really cloud your judgment. They can, they really can. And lead to bad decisions. Impulsive decisions. Yeah, impulsive decisions, exactly. So, Link, he dives deep into those emotions. Okay. Greed, fear, hope, <laughs> the need for control. The need for control, yeah. We all want to be in control. We do. But sometimes the market has other plans. The market has other plans. So he talks about developing a detached objective mindset. A detached objective mindset, yeah. Not getting too caught up in the moment. Not getting too caught up, yeah. Not letting those emotions dictate your decisions. Treat trading as a business. As a business, not a casino. Not a casino, exactly. Okay, I like that. So he offers some practical advice. Okay. For maintaining a clear mind. Okay, like what? Sticking to your trading plan. Sticking to your plan. Okay. Managing your risk. Managing your risk, yep. And accepting that you can't win every trade. You can't win them all. You can't win them all, no. But you can try. You can try. He also talks about the importance of patience. Patience, so important. Discipline. Discipline, yes. It's about waiting for those high probability setups. Those high probability setups, the ones that fit your criteria. And then executing them with precision. Exactly. Not chasing every trade. Not chasing every trade, no. Only the ones that make sense for you. Okay, I'm starting to see the light here. I'm glad to hear it. This is all starting to make sense. Good. good. It's like Link is giving us the keys to the kingdom. He's giving us a roadmap. A roadmap. A yeah. framework for thinking about the markets. For thinking about the markets. And approaching trading in a systematic, disciplined way. Systematic, disciplined. I like it. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground in this second part of our deep dive. Yeah. From oscillators and chart patterns okay. to entry and exit strategies. Yep. And the all important psychological aspects of trading. Mental game. The mental game's so important. It is. You gotta be mentally tough to be a trader. You do. Now, what else is on the agenda for the final part of our exploration? Well, we'll be diving into system trading. System trading, okay. Back testing. Back testing. And that all important concept of money management. Money management. Can't wait to hear about those. All right, stay tuned for part three of our deep dive into high probability trading. Welcome back to the deep dive. We're wrapping up our exploration of Marcel Link's high probability trading. And it's safe to say this book has been a game changer for me. It really is a treasure trove of trading wisdom, isn't it? It is. And, you know, we've covered so much ground already. Yeah, from those early learning years. Right. To identifying trends and navigating those sometimes crazy chart patterns. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's not forget about managing our emotions. Oh, yeah, that's huge. And having a plan for both the wins and the losses. You got to have a plan for both. Exactly. But there are a few key concepts we still need to dive into. Right. Let's talk about system trading. System trading. Okay. Back testing. Back testing. And, of course, money management. Money management, the cornerstone of it all. Absolutely essential. Okay. So let's start with system trading. Okay. I'll admit that term always sounds a bit intimidating to me. I get it. it can sound complex. Yeah, like, are we talking about building robots to trade for us? Not necessarily. Do we need to learn how to code? No, no coding required. Okay, good. Link breaks it down really well, <laughs> even for someone who's never seen a line of code. All right, good, because that's me. At its core, a system is simply a set of rules yeah. that you use to make trading decisions. Okay, so instead of relying on my gut feeling yeah. or, you know, reacting emotionally to every little market blip. Right. I have a predefined plan. You have a plan. For how I'll approach 
each trade. Exactly. Think of it like a recipe for trading success. Okay. A recipe. I like that. You have your ingredients, your indicators and chart patterns. Okay. And your instructions. Oh, okay. Your rules for entry exit and risk management. So it's like taking the emotion out of the equation. That's the goal. And helping you make more objective, disciplined decisions. Precisely. Okay. I'm liking this already. Now, Link talks about two main types of systems. Okay. Mechanical and discretionary. Okay, what's the difference? Mechanical systems are like those self-driving cars. Oh, okay. Once you set the rules, they follow them. Without any human intervention. Exactly no room for second guessing or emotional overrides. So if you're someone who tends to get swayed by fear or greed. Yeah. A mechanical system might be a good way to impose some discipline. Exactly. It takes the human element out of it. Okay. What about discretionary systems? Discretionary systems allow for a bit more flexibility. Okay. You have your basic rules. Right. But you can also use your own judgment and analysis. To fine tune my decisions. Exactly. It's like having a co-pilot who offers suggestions. Okay. But you're still the one ultimately in control of the plane. I like that analogy. So both approaches have their pros and cons. Right. It's about finding the right fit for you. Exactly what works best for your personality. Your risk tolerance. Your risk tolerance. And your level of trading experience. Absolutely. Okay, so once you've developed a system, how do you know if it actually works? That's where backtesting comes in. Backtest. Okay, what is that? Imagine you're a time traveler. Okay, I like time travel. You can go back and see how your system would have performed in the past. So it's like running a simulation. It's like a simulation. And to see if my system can handle the real world of trading. Exactly. You're testing your system on historical data. Okay. To see how it would have handled different market conditions. Makes sense. What kind of things should I be looking for when I'm back testing? Well, you want to see a consistent track record of profitability. Of course. But you also want to look at the system's win rate. Win rate. Okay. The average size of its wins and losses. Okay. And its maximum drawdown. Maximum drawdown. What's that? It's the biggest drop your account would have experienced during the backtesting period. So even if a system is profitable overall, yeah. if that maximum drawdown is huge. It'd be a red flag. Yeah, especially for someone like me with a low risk tolerance. Exactly. It's all about finding a system that aligns with your risk profile and your financial goals. Now, Link also talks about avoiding something called curve fitting. Curve fitting. Yeah, that's a big one. What is that? Imagine you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Okay, not going to work. You keep tweaking and adjusting the peg until it finally fits. Right. But it's a forced fit. It's not a good fit. And it's not going to hold up in the long run. So curve fitting is basically when you tweak your system's parameters. To fit the past data perfectly. But it doesn't actually reflect how the system will perform in the future. Right. It's like creating a system that's designed to win in the past. But the market's always changing. The market is always changing, so it's not going to work in the future. So how do you avoid that trap? Link recommends testing your system on a separate data set okay. called out-of-sample data. Out-of-sample data. That it hasn't been optimized for. So it's like giving your system a test drive on a new road. Exactly, with unexpected twists and turns. To see how it handles the challenge. You want to see if it can adapt. Okay, back testing is all about due diligence. It is. Making sure your system is robust and reliable before you risk real money. Exactly. You want to be confident in your system. Now, I was really intrigued by Link's comparison of system trading to professional gambling. Oh, yeah. That's a fascinating analogy. I mean, what do those two things even have in common? Well, Link points out that successful traders and professional gamblers share some key traits. Okay, like what? Discipline. Okay. Risk management. Uh, and understanding the odds. So it's about approaching trading as a game of skill. Exactly, not chance. And just like in gambling. Money management is key. Money management is crucial. For long-term success. I think Link really hammers that point home. He does. In his chapter on setting risk parameters and making a money management plan. It's all about protecting your capital. Protecting your capital, not chasing those big wins. Right. He even recommends only allocating half of your trading capital to active trading. Really, only half? Yeah, and keeping the other half as a buffer. A buffer. Okay. To cushion against those inevitable losing streaks. So it's like a safety net. Exactly. Knowing that even if I hit a rough patch, I'm not going to wipe out my entire account. Mm. Right. You're protecting yourself from financial disaster. And he also advocates for something called fixed fraction money management. Fixed fraction money management. What is that? It means risking only a small fixed percentage of your capital right. on any single trade. 
So like two to five percent. Two to five percent typically. So even if a trade goes against me, yeah, I'm only risking a small portion of my overall portfolio. Exactly. You're controlling your downside risk. I like it. I like it. He uses a great analogy to illustrate this. Okay, let's hear it. He compares money management to the brakes on a car. Okay. You can have the fastest car in the world, right. but if you don't have good brakes, you're going to crash. You're going to crash. Money management is our braking system. Exactly. It keeps you in control. It prevents those financial disasters. Exactly. I love that analogy. And to really drive this point home, yeah. he quotes Mr. Micawber from Charles Dickens' David Copperfield. I love how he brings in these literary references. Me too. It makes it so much more engaging. Okay, what's the quote? Annual income, 20 pounds annual expenditure, 19, 19, and 6 result happiness. Okay. Annual income, 20 pounds, annual expenditure, 20 pounds ought, and six result misery. Okay, so basically, if you spend more than you earn... You're going to be miserable. You're headed for trouble. Exactly. And Link applies that same principle to trading. Right. It's about managing your risk, protecting your capital, making sure you have enough staying power to weather those inevitable storms. Trading is a marathon, not a sprint. You got to pace yourself. You got to pace yourself. And the traders who succeed are the ones who have the discipline, the patience, and the money management skills to stay in the game for the long haul. This has been such an incredible deep dive. It has been a journey. We've learned so much from Marcel Link's high probability trading. We've covered a lot of ground. We have from the technical side to the psychological side. To the importance of having a solid trading plan. And a robust money management strategy. Absolutely. It's like we've been given a master class in mm. trading. From one of the best in the business. And you know what really stuck with me? What's that? His advice to be more selective. Quality over quantity. It's not about being in every trade. Right. It's about being in the right trades. The ones that fit your system and your risk tolerance. So as you continue your own trading journey, remember the wisdom of Marcel Wink. Stay disciplined. Stay patient. Manage your risk. And always be on the lookout for those high probability trades. And never stop learning. That's such a great point. Trading is a journey of continuous learning. It is. You're always growing and evolving. And adapting to the ever-changing market. This has been an amazing deep dive. It has. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. We hope you found it insightful and inspiring. And we hope you'll join us again for our next deep dive into the world of trading. Happy trading, everyone. Happy trading.